Thank you so much, everyone, for continuing uh, to follow along with us. Thank you, Era, for such a great meditation yoga practice to get started. Um, for those of you who might be new to join us, my name is Jocelyn Luckis. I am an oncology nutrition specialist with the Robert H. Lurie Comprehensive Cancer Center. I've been with the supportive oncology team for about six years now, but I've been in practice for 13. As an oncology nutrition specialist, my um, big goal of care for people who might be going through cancer treatment is to help them manage to eat their healthiest while managing side effects from cancer or its treatment. So today we're going to talk about the importance of meal planning. Um, and so we've got a few great plant-based recipes for you that you might be able to try um, after you see me um, prepping some of these for you today. All of the recipes in the shopping list will be available on the Cancer Connections website after we're finished today. So with meal preparation, I find that the old adage, failing to plan is planning to fail, could not ring truer um, in terms of when it comes to meal planning and preparation. If I haven't prepped or planned for the week ahead, I feel that sense of dread kind of roll around around 4.35 o'clock thinking, oh my gosh, what am I gonna have for dinner? Do I have the ingredients? I'm staring at the back of an empty fridge. What am I gonna hobble together for myself and my family? So with meal preparation um, and planning, that can take care of some of those feelings of dread, stress, anxiety, all of which we can just try to minimize or want to minimize, especially these days. So this can be true for um, you know, people as they're preparing for treatment or during treatment, maybe you're planning to do some meal prep on those weeks that you're feeling strong if you're going through some type of treatment right now um, and prepping for those days where it's a little bit more difficult to you know, stand in the kitchen and chop or cook. Um, if you're a caregiver, family, friend, you know, prepping some things for um, somebody who might be going through treatment, but also it's that old adage too, you gotta take care of yourself before you can take care of others. So, you know, if you're helping get someone to appointments, things like that, what better way to help support yourself than, oh, I don't have to worry about what's for dinner or what's for lunch today. It's already prepped and ready to go in my fridge. So a few things about meal planning before we get started. It really is going to take some time to plan to do, uh, you need to plan to do the planning, basically. Um, so, thinking about a day of the week that might work for you to plan. Maybe it's a day off, maybe you have the weekends available. Usually you wanna plan ahead uh, before you do your grocery shopping, whether you're shopping in person or getting them delivered, um, but taking that time to, to set aside a planning time. Usually it only takes about you know, half hour, 40 minutes or so, um, but a few other things when, to take into account when you're planning. Um, I like to think about the four S's. So first you wanna check your stock. You wanna make sure that you have the ingredients that you need, and if not, you're adding those to your shopping list. Nothing frustrates me more than when I get, say, um, you know, some garlic powder and I have a fresh uh, container already in my pantry. So checking your pantry items, checking your produce, maybe taking into consideration if you have something that looks like it's getting closer to its expiration date in terms of your produce, maybe you're planning to use that first um, earlier in the week um, and using that up. Same thing with your proteins, you know, trying to, if you're using like some chicken, some fish, some beef, um, seeing what you have on hand and then trying to use that first to save you some money at the grocery store. Speaking of saving money at the grocery store, checking those sale ads. Um, you can check online on the grocery sale ads. If you get the paper, those come uh, weekly. So just seeing what's on sale and trying to maximize your dollar with what's on sale and um, picking some recipes based on some of those things that might be on sale. Um, checking your storage. This is really important to make sure you have your storage containers or even the uh, refrigerator freezer space that you need. Um, that might determine too if you're going to plan for a week ahead. Some people when they get the hang of it are planning for like two or three weeks ahead, but that requires more storage containers, more storage space. So just taking all of that into account as well. Um, and then finally checking your steps, trying to um, minimize the amount of time that you have to take, say chopping ingredients, things like that. For example, we're using two recipes today that have a common ingredient of butternut squash. So we're gonna chop up the squash all at once and that will be ready for both of our salad and our tacos um, later. So we're gonna knock that stuff out all at once. So let's get started. Um, today we're going to start with a pumpkin spice overnight oat. Um, you know, pumpkin spice is a big seasonal favorite right now and I wasn't about to pass up that opportunity today. Um, so overnight oats are also really popular. You can find a lot of variations out there on the internet. 
Um, so to get started, I'm using just simple mason jars. Um, you can find these at pretty much any big box store. Um, secondhand stores also frequently sell them, but you can also use like an old spaghetti jar or a pickle jar. Just make sure it's well washed. Um, you don't want pickle flavored overnight oats. Um, but you can use any type of glass jar to get this started. So I'm just gonna turn my camera a little bit so you can see where I'm getting started. Um, so I have my jar um, and I'm just going to add half a cup of overnight oats or half a cup of oats, excuse me. And so I just have that in the bottom. And then from there, I'm going to add all of my wet ingredients together. I usually like to add um, my wet ingredients to a measuring cup just so I can mix them all together. They get a little bit more uniformly mixed and then I can easily pour them in to my mason jar. So I have here a half a cup of almond milk. I have to that that I'm going to add two tablespoons of pureed pumpkin. Then I'm going to add a third a cup of plain Greek yogurt. Some people like to use like a vanilla yogurt just for a little bit more flavor. You can certainly do that. Although we are adding um, both some maple syrup and some vanilla for some additional flavor and sweetness. So I'm gonna add those all together. And I'm just gonna give those a quick mix. From there, I'm just gonna pour that into my overnight oats. Um, and along with that, I'm going to add a few other ingredients. These are my dry ingredients. So I have two tablespoons of chia seeds. Um, I have a half a teaspoon of cinnamon, a quarter teaspoon of ginger, and a quarter teaspoon of nutmeg, and just a pinch of salt to add a little bit of flavor. So I'm going to then mix those in as well. So as I'm mixing, I'll probably give it just a quick stir to get started. And then I'll put my lid on and give it a quick shake. So for these um, overnight oats too, you can add chia seeds or you can also use flax seeds. So um, both of them are great because they add protein and fiber, which help keep you feeling full longer. They kind of avoid that 10 o'clock slump um, when you've had your breakfast in the morning. Um, so they, they do have a little bit of a different flavor profile, excuse me, instead. So um, flax seeds have a little bit of a nuttier flavor while chia seeds are a little bit more bland. But what they do too is also soak up some of the liquid in there and help make them thick and um, really enjoyable. Um, in terms of other nutrients that these seeds can offer, um, flax seeds offer a little bit more of those omega-3 fatty acids, which are really good um, anti-inflammatory properties, uh, while chia seeds offer a little bit more in the way of calcium. So you'll see in that quick uh, bout of time, we've made one quick easy breakfast. Um, if you are preparing for yourself for the week or um, for someone else at home, you can do these all kind of individually and just repeat the steps um, kind of in a batch fashion. Um, so I will make these for myself, for my husband, and we'll store them in the fridge for the week and they're just a quick, easy grab and go item. Um, and it's up to you to choose whether you want to heat them up or um, keep them cold. Um, so moving on to the next uh, recipe, we are going to make a roasted butternut squash, kale, and pomegranate salad. So I'm gonna switch views here for just a quick minute. Okay, and so then you'll see, um, this is our little overhead prep space. And so I'm going to start out with our butternut squash. So um, again, I'm using, I'm doing this first, kind of skipping ahead with some of the steps because uh, we're gonna use this for both recipes. It takes about 40 minutes to roast. Um, so we really want to make sure we have um, this ready to go when we need it. So butternut squash is definitely having a little bit of a moment right now. You can get butternut squash in a lot of different varieties um, and a lot of it can be 
prepped ahead. So for example, I have some frozen variety that's available. Um, I've also seen it in ribbons or chunked up, um, you know, in the produce section. So you can use all of these things too if the idea of peeling and chopping a squash is a little bit intimidating to you. But I'm here to demystify it for you, show you that it's not um, as intimidating as it might seem. So um, to do that, we'll start by peeling our butternut squash. So you just peel with a vegetable peeler, um, long strokes to get that skin off. Um, I've also taken the time to microwave my butternut squash for like two to three minutes. Um, that just helps soften it up and makes it a little bit easier to cut. So we're peeling the butternut squash um, for time's sake. I'm gonna skip to our next step, but you would peel this whole squash in entirety. So from there, you would cut the neck off. So you have more of like that pumpkin type look at the bottom, the gourd part. And that's where all the seeds are. We gotta take those out. So you can see that there, how the seeds are in. What we're gonna do, I just have a little scallop serving spoon that makes it a little bit easier um, to kind of remove all of those seeds from the squash. There's a lot of them in this one. They're like pumpkin seeds, so if you wanna save them, wash them off, you can definitely roast them. That would be a great addition to this salad as well. Um, for this salad, we are gonna be roasting some walnuts instead. But that's pretty much all that there is to it. Um, again, for time's sake, uh, I'm going to, for the magic of television, um, show you what that might look like as finished. Um, so we just want, you know, kind of an even dice on all of these. Again, this is both going for um, our salad and for our tacos. So you might do a little bit smaller dice for some of your tacos. Sometimes people will make a really nice presentation and cut these in rings to kind of loop over the top of the salad. Um, but you can do either option. Um, so let's move on to our kale. Um, and so I have fresh kale, but you can also use any type of bagged kale variety that you want as well, if you want to save a little bit of time. So again, one of those that can be kind of intimidating um, at first, like uh, they're kind of rough and rubbery um, if you've never worked with kale before, um, but it's really great. Um, it's a really nutrient dense, fiber rich source of um, a vegetable. So to get started, we want to remove the leaves from this thick leafy stem. Um, and it's kind of fun, you just kind of zip along the stem and you peel your leaf right off. So again, zipping along and there's our leaf. From there, you can roll these up a little bit. And then chop into a um, kind of nice ribbons. If you wanna get that together again and do a nice cross chop so it's a little bit more um, bite size, you can also do that. So again, I was talking a little bit how, how this can be kind of tough and leathery. Um, kale, kind of like all of us, can need a good massage from time to time. Um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to break down those rough cell walls um, and we're gonna do that in a couple of ways. First, we're going to use a little bit of acid. So today we're gonna use some lemon um, and what that's gonna do is help break down some of those cell walls. You could also use a vinegar or like a vinegar and oil, um, but we're gonna just massage that onto the kale. Um, but before we do that, we are also going to use a little bit of salt. This salt too um, can also draw some of the water out of the kale um, and just make it softer. So we're gonna give that a good massage. Um, you know, we would do this with a lot more. Um, again, I'm just showing you for the sake of demonstration purposes, what that might look like. Um, so the, after that, you wanna let it sit and let it do its work for a little bit. Um, 
And then you can add the rest of the ingredients that we're about to start now into our salad. So from there, we are going to start making some of our roasted walnuts. So I have some walnuts here, um, about a half of a cup. I'm just going to give a little swish of olive oil into my pan. And then we'll add those walnuts. Um, it's something that you really want to watch closely and stir kind of frequently because uh, these walnuts can go from roasted to burnt really quickly. So we're just going to give those a little bit of a swish. While I'm doing that too, um, you know, going back to our butternut squash, we're going to um, want to season half of our butternut squash with some turmeric, some salt, and some pepper. So I'm gonna season one half here. Um, add a little olive oil and kind of mix it around. And then for the other half with these tacos, we're going to do some chili powder, some salt, and some pepper. Again, trying to delineate half. Um, it's nice because one has a distinctive red color um, with the chili and the other that bright yellow color with the turmeric. So again, after we've mixed all of that together um, with a little bit of olive oil, we are going to add, uh, put this in the oven um, at 400 degrees for about 30 minutes or so. So again, checking up on our nuts. Um, you can't smell them through your TV or through your computer, but you can, um, they're starting to get aromatic. Um, just giving them a quick flip. Um, they're also getting pretty golden. Um, so while we continue on, let's make a little bit of our dressing. So I have cheated with this dressing and that I bought a pre-mixed olive oil um, and vinegar dressing. So we're, it's a quarter cup of olive oil and vinegar dressing. And to that, we are going to add a teaspoon of maple syrup and a teaspoon of Dijon mustard. We're just gonna add that. And we'll give it a few quick shakes here. And just like that, you have a quick, easy dressing. Um, that olive oil and vinegar dressing is a great base for a lot of different things. Um, and so you can make a lot of dressings really quickly and easily with that. So we'll give our walnuts just another quick toss. They're looking great um, and ready to go. And so from there, I've also left a mason jar because you can certainly pack this salad um, to go with you if you're on the go, if you're going to work, or um, you know, if you have appointments and you wanted to pack a salad, this is one of those that packs really great. Um, so our butternut squash has been roasting and is ready to go. Um, again, I had done this a little bit ahead of time and I made rings just so we can see with that, um, but it makes a really great presentation um, if you're serving this to guests. So I'm going to give my salad a quick toss with this dressing. And that too, the longer it has to soak, the more flavor that it can offer. Um, and you can see how this has had time to sit. Um, and so it's a lot softer, a lot more pliable than our original leaf of kale. Um, and that's just the magic, magic of breaking down that cell wall. Okay, from there, we can add, you know, some pieces of our butternut squash if we're serving it. Um, I am using, so this calls for pomegranate, but um, I've had a little bit of difficulty finding pomegranate. It's usually more in season later um, in the fall, early winter. Um, so if you don't have the ability to purchase some pomegranate right now, you can always use something like dried um, cranberries 
Um, you can also use something like golden raisins. Those are really seasonal right now. So as you can see, there's a lot of different colors here. You'll hear dietitians um, and talking about you know, eating the colors of the rainbow quite often, and that couldn't be more true um, than for this salad. We've got a lot of deep purples, oranges, greens, um, yellows, lots of different nutrients packing this salad. Um, again, this is mainly a plant-based uh, salad, and this is a plant-based cooking class, but if you felt uh, like you wanted to add a little bit of an animal-based protein, something like a grilled chicken or a grilled fish would go well. Um, in this recipe. So that is how to prep the butternut squash salad. Um, let's move on finally to our tacos. So I'll just move this here a little bit. Again, we have done a lot of the prep work um, with our butternut squash, so that's all ready to go. Um, we're going to start by making a slaw for our tacos. So this is cabbage and black beans. It's two cups of cabbage, two cups of black beans that have been rinsed. Um, it's important if you use canned black beans to really try to rinse them to get a lot of the sodium off of there. Um, we're gonna add to that a third a cup of green onion and a third a cup of cilantro. I know cilantro can be a pretty polarizing um, ingredient. So if you are not a cilantro fan, you can certainly leave that out. Um, today we are going to add um, two tablespoons of plain yogurt. This takes on kind of like a sour cream type taste with less fat. Uh, two tablespoons of low fat mayonnaise, a teaspoon of garlic powder, a quarter teaspoon of salt. And from there, we're just gonna mix this all together. You can add or take away some um, dressing if you'd like. If this is something that you're prepping ahead, um, some of the water in the slaw will actually be drawn out the more it sits. So you might be cautious with adding more wet ingredients if this is something that's gonna sit for a day or two. Um, but this is how you make that slaw. I also had some lime juice that I needed to add to that too. So this is two to three tablespoons. This is kind of where you can kind of add or subtract. Um, like I didn't use all of that lime juice right now. Okay, so now that we have our slaw ready to go, our butternut squash is getting ready. Um, the last thing that we wanna do is make just a simple guac. So for this, I'm going to use half of an avocado, which I'll just peel, or I'm sorry, um, Open this way. And I'm gonna use a spoon to scoop out the avocado inside. Make sure you don't leave the pit in there. Um, and then I'm going to add um, some lime juice to stop the browning process. Um, if an avocado is exposed to air too long, it'll start to turn really brown and not be very appealing. It's still okay to eat, um, but just doesn't look so great. So you can chop that up this way. Um, I also have a handy contraption that can kind of grind this up a little bit. So we're just gonna really um, rustically kind of chop this up just to make a quick guacamole. If you wanna add um, some coriander, a little pinch of salt, that also goes a long way. So I'm gonna actually add this whole avocado because we're guac fans in our house. So again, mashing that up a little bit. And you have a quick, easy guac. Um, I should say too that this slaw and the guacamole, um, you don't have to use it just in this recipe. This is just kind of how quick and easy that you can make some of these really nutrient rich plant based ingredients that add a lot of flavor and a lot of color as well. So from there, I am going to take my other half of the butternut squash the, with the chili on it. And I'm going to 
take some corn tortillas. If you want to heat these up ahead of time, you can certainly do that as well. Um, but I'll add a little bit of slaw, some roasted squash, and a little bit of guac. So again, you can see how colorful this is. Um, this is something too that would be great, you know, if you're watching the game, a great fall recipe, it's kind of quick, easy, you can make ahead um, and serve up to your family um, as you're enjoying the game. So again, all of these are really plant-based. My husband is usually my litmus test and um, he enjoys meat on things like tacos and he didn't miss it. So all the black beans are providing a lot of protein. Um, the guac provides a lot of fat to help keep you feeling full. And so those things together, um, in addition to the fiber that you're getting in all of these um, between the squash, um, the black beans and the slaw, um, it's a really great option. So in just 25 minutes, we have um, made some dinner. Uh, so with the butternut squash tacos, we have a great salad option here. And then we started our day with some pumpkin spice oats. So thank you so much for watching me cook. Um, I hope this inspires you to meal prep if you haven't already. Um, and please check out the recipes on the Cancer Connection website. Um, do you have any questions? Okay. So one of the first questions is, I've heard how sugar can exacerbate cancer. How do I have my usual dessert while eliminating a possible carcinogen, knowing that almost everything contains some kind of sugar? I have, for the most part, cut out refined sugar. Uh, great question. It's something that we see often um, working in nutrition in the oncology sector. The idea that sugar feeds cancer is a very oversimplified idea. So sugar is also a name for carbohydrate. Um, so carbohydrate is in a lot of really great foods, including our fruits and our vegetables. It's our body's main source of energy. So if we don't have carbohydrate in our diet, our bodies can actually break down fat into carbohydrate and use it. Um, with that being said, I'm certainly with you, John. I want my dessert as well. Um, so to that, I usually tell people everything in moderation. So a lot of these um, foods that we had today, while they might have a little bit more carbohydrate, they um, aren't increasing our body's blood sugar response as much as like a piece of cake um, or, you know, another really sugary dessert. So I'll say start there, um, you know, trying to have something that's really high in fiber, really high in protein to kind of help blunt some of that blood sugar response because we're finding that it might not necessarily be the sugar, but it's our body's response to the sugar, whether it's those spikes in blood sugar that can trigger an insulin release, or maybe if we're eating a lot of these sugary foods, they're unfortunately often a lot higher in calories as well. That can lead to some weight gain, potentially overweight obesity, which we know um, can be a risk factor for certain cancers. So um, again, saying more just moderation, um, have your dessert, maybe not having you know, a quarter of a cake, maybe having an eighth of a cake, um, a little bit of a slice, trying to keep it to more special occasions than an everyday. Um, but enjoying everything just the same. Life is for living, don't skip dessert, um, but just be a little bit more mindful. You know, sometimes we're using like fruits or something like that for dessert instead. All right. Is canola oil really that much better than using olive or even corn oil for cooking? I do not like the taste of canola oil. Um, so yes, uh, this is a great question too. I feel like um, a lot of these oils, be it, canola oil, olive oil, avocado oil, um, some of them are, they become in vogue and they get a little bit of a health halo even. Like I have had people say, well, I use oil, but it's olive oil, so it's totally fine. Uh, not quite. 
Oil is oil. It's the most dense source of calories for us. So even if you are using a quote unquote healthier oil, if you're trying to, you know, watch your overall caloric intake, we still say using some of those oils sparingly. I will say using um, an unsaturated oil is going to be a little bit more heart healthy than say like a butter or a lard um, that has a lot of saturated fat and we know um, can contribute to heart disease, things like that. So bottom line is you use whatever oil you want. Um, I'd say you can use canola oil if you prefer to use an olive oil, that's great. Um, you know, avocado oil, like I said, it's a little bit more in bulk, but it's got a really kind of mild flavor to it. That's a great option um, if you don't like the taste of canola oil, um, but still using all of those oils regardless of what they are in a little bit more moderation. Okay, um, the next one is soy bad for estrogen receptor po positive cancer. So this is a great question too that comes up often. I would say soy, um, without giving a whole biology lesson on estrogen receptor positive or negative breast cancer, I would just lump it in to say that soy unprocessed is going to be best, kind of like all of our other foods. Um, so I would say even if you've had estrogen receptor positive breast cancer and you want some soy, be it like soy milk or tofu edamame, you can have it, um, you know, in like one to two servings a day um, without any increased risk on cancer. Um, where we get concerned is more of the concentrated source, sources of soy. Um, soy is easily grown in the U.S. and it's found in lots of different things. Um, if you have had a soy, or excuse me, an estrogen, estrogen positive or estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, excuse me, the ingredient that I want you to watch for is soy protein concentrate. Um, that's in a lot of processed food, mainly in the way of like meatless burgers, um, meatlet or a lot of protein bars use soy concentrated um, soy protein isolate. Those um, are some things that I want you to be mindful of and try to avoid if you've had an estrogen receptor positive, estrogen <laughs> receptor positive breast cancer. Um, I would say, again, trying to choose soy more in its whole food form. So soy milk, soy yogurt, tofu, edamame, all of those are acceptable. Um, just trying to minimize your intake of the processed stuff. All right, um, the next question from Anna, is it better to limit meat or become vegetarian? Um, we do know from research specifically from the American Institute for Cancer Research and the American Cancer Society, um, a lot of uh, cancers can be related to diet and lifestyle. And we have found that people who eat mainly plant-based seem to have lower incidences of certain types of cancers. So while we're not saying you have to become vegetarian or vegan, there's really not a ton of evidence to support that. But the more uh, you can introduce plants into your diet, um, the more beneficial it seems to be and protective against certain types of cancers. And when you think about it, you think about what fruits and vegetables contain. Um, they're just a really dense source of nutrients, uh, vitamins, minerals. Um, fiber, all of that can really kind of help our system. And they're usually lower in calories too. So all of those things combined can help uh, decrease risk of cancer. But no, you don't necessarily need to become vegetarian or vegan. I have a lot of people, um, Meatless Mondays were really popular uh, starting a couple of years ago that um, maybe people are just starting where they're at. So if you can cut back to like one day a week where you're trying to eat vegetarian, that's great and more plant-based. So people have done a meatless Monday movement, um, you know, trying different recipes out um, that are more plant-based or vegan um, are a great step to take, but not needing to completely eliminate um, meats or fish. Um, are Morningstar Farm bacon and sausage actually healthy? Or are they full of dying calories too? That bacon looks awfully red. Um, so I don't wanna call out any specific brands, um, but it is more processed. Um, so just kind of along the lines that I was talking with the soy, if we can minimize eating a lot of that processed stuff, um, even a plant-based bacon or sausage is still um, processed. So, you know, if you want it on occasion, that's great, but I wouldn't make it a, a mainstay of your everyday. Um, and are there any particular 
teas that are recommended or not recommended for breast cancer survivors? Um, that is a great question. Um, I would say it depends on where you're at in your treatment. If you're going through treatment, I would advise you talking to your oncologist. If you have a registered dietitian that you're working with or that you're able to talk to um, and you're going through treatment, please talk to them about it because um, it, it would individualize. Otherwise, if you are past treatment um, and not taking any type of hormonal treatment or things like that after say like a chemo or a radiation, um, usually like a green tea is, is a great source of antioxidants and a good start to the day. Um, black teas also are great, but I don't have any specific ones um, that I would say, yes, you need to make that part of your everyday. Really great questions today. Thank you for sticking with me to the very end. I know we went a little bit over time today. I really appreciate you taking time out of your Saturday to join us. Um, I have a few things to wrap up with here. Um, so yes, again, thank you for spending time with us at Cancer Connections. And on behalf of the Lurie Cancer Center, thank you, be safe, stay healthy, and we wish you well. Take care.